as I said, I mean, I think both of these, like the, the news and noteworthy things around the Bruins have been kind of nothing burgers in the last week, but we have two. We'll start in Subban and Yandel. We're hearing that the Bruins have at least entertained the idea of signing one or both of them to PTO. Let's start with Yandel and we'll start with Kevin. I know you've written about this already. Um, how do you feel about Keith Yandel and the Boston Bruins? I mean, yeah, so um, it's a little tough. Like, Yandel, he's 36. A lot of people don't see him having that drive anymore. And he's a guy, it's like, but really, he's a plug. He would come in after December when McAvoy and everyone's back. He wouldn't be in the lineup. He'd be a guy that helps you get through these first couple months of the uh, season. I think he's a good locker room guy. Great locker room guy. Great veteran to bring in especially if it's on the PTO. So, I mean, it doesn't hurt if it's a PTO. Bring him in, see what he still has, see what he can offer the team. And, like, he's a guy that can accept the role of – he's not playing every night, but he can be a plug. Put him in. A guy needs to rest. Put him in without having to worry about you having, like, some inexperienced guy in there and cost new games. So, I like the handle if you bring him in cheap. Before we go to Connor, so like normally you you need to say like he's a plug and play guy, because just calling him a plug in hockey, it, it's that's actually a you know it, that means you suck. Oh, it's okay. Really? You don't have to be. It's okay. I mean, I think that shoe still fits. Yeah, you can handle. I mean, yeah, I I agree. But you go. Yeah, he's he's not the greatest anymore. So. Um, I think it was Boston Hockey Now who made the article about the Bruins potentially signing these two to a PTO. And I think everybody kind of forgot what the situation really is. You know, you're not signing Keith Yandel to be in your top four defensive pairing. But yeah. He not, wasn't in the flyers top six by the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, you're just not everybody hears Keith Yandel and they think, Oh, you know, we're going to sign him to be a stud defenseman. No, that's not what he's looking for anymore. That's not what Subban's really looking at anymore either. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people are really kind of discounting here is he's freaking from the Boston area. I mean, that gives you a 40% chance to sign with Don Sweeney no matter what. Um, but I think it's it's pretty obvious that P.K. Subban is probably the better choice there. Definitely. Um, it, it sounds like both of these players are going to end up on a pretty cheap, you know, quote unquote veteran contract this year and potentially, you know, make that run for a cup. Neither of these players are going to go sign a big money ticket with, you know, a Buffalo or Detroit or Arizona and then hope to get moved at the deadline. I just don't see that happening. No, no, I, I, I don't think either of them are doing that at all. They're both going to – either one of them will have a PTO with a team that's probably they think is a contender. They can go help. Subban, I do think – if Subban signed a PTO or signed a contract with the Bruins, I do think Subban plays. I think Subban could be in our top six, and he could be an asset on the team. Um, and there's this this honestly like negative aura about Subban around ignorant Bruins fans who don't realize that Subban is actually a great guy. Like, Subban's a great locker room guy. He would be accepted in that locker room in a heartbeat. He's not a guy that's hated, like I think everyone thinks he is. I think it's just whether it's the just ignorant racism that is Boston that, like, you see on Facebook where people are like, we don't want this guy. It's like, fuck you. Like, he, he would be good for the Boston Bruins. I, I really think that. Like, it, I would be happy if they signed Subban. Yandel, I've always been a Keith Yandel fan. I, I always have been. Do I think Keith Yandel could be our seventh, eighth defenseman and be good in the locker room? Yeah. But do we want Keith Yandel rolled out every night? No. And I, I don't know that Keith Yandel wants to be rolled out any night e either anymore, like every night either. I, I think that Keith, from the amount of interviews I've heard with him, is a pretty self-aware guy. So, And I think he is someone who knows the role that he would be coming in on Boston, and he would fit it well. So I think either one of them would be an asset to the organization. And I don't know how much that is on the ice or it is in the locker room. But, you know, you look at the, the Bruins team that won the Stanley Cup in 2011. There was guys who were through there. Like, think about a guy like Shane Knighty. Didn't play a lot. But he is someone that every single guy in that team has a story about because he was such a good locker room guy. Those guys are needed. And it's not like this Bruins team is lacking veteran leadership. 
but I think there's been enough turnover in the last two and a half years that more guys to help bring this group together under a new coaching staff, under some future uncertainty is not going to hurt. That's just my opinion on it. It's like, I don't, I don't necessarily think we need either of them to get out there and play our best hockey, but I don't think either hamper the team's ability to, to win. Yeah. I mean, I definitely hear what you're saying. Um, and for me, the, the only reason that I'll say that this doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense is even with Grizzlick and McAvoy out, you know, you've got Forbert, Clifton, Riley, um, Zaboral, who you're expecting to be healthy again this year. Like, Carlo. well, I was already penciling him. Yeah, in. obviously. Yeah. yeah. The, the plug and play plugs, if you will. Lindholm. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> like, yeah. I know. I mean, yeah. Like the Bruins have, like, if, do you already have four guys that are going to be fighting for those last two spots when the team's healthy? And that's just a fact. Yeah. The crickets. So, the, I can hear the crickets and it's, it's just amazing. You, yeah. They're loud. I, I don't know what Midwest their problem boy. is, but every, <laughs> every time we record, they want to be chirping in our ears, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the only reason that this doesn't make sense is kind of the overwhelming amount of depth that the Bruins have. But I mean, if you take them on a PTO and then you sign them to seven hundred and fifty thousand, some point in the year, I mean, one year seven hundred fifty thousand, you could do a lot worse than that. You could also waive them. True. Like it's just like yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think it would hurt the team. I guess that's really. Well, but again, a, it's still like a nothing burger of information. Like if they, it's probably not even going to happen. On a thirty-five plus contract, there's there's no, no oh yeah no, right. it's no you're movement right. clause you're right. so you're right. You're right. I don't know if Subban applies I believe he's over thirty five I don't I, I don't recall off the it. top of my head but yeah hundred percent I could definitely see some other players being waived and it's dead but that's kind no, of counterproductive Subban's thirty three okay so he wouldn't apply you'd be able to do it to him yeah he's not as old as everyone thinks Subban is he's really like I think Subban still has game left in him he I mean he was he, he played. He, he still played 77 games last year. Like he wasn't, he wasn't sat. He had 22 points. He's not. I feel like Subban is <clears throat> a result of his own stupidity with his contract. So he wanted to, you know, sign a big ticket when he had a big year in Montreal. They gave him a bridge deal and he outperformed his bridge deal and they had to sign him to the huge ticket. And then shortly thereafter, decided to trade him in the uh, the Shea Weber trade. Yeah. Then, of course, that didn't work out on the back end for the Predators, so they moved him again because of his contract. And then he ends up in a place that's rebuilding and kind <coughs> of, you know, a dumpster fire when it's he got hard. there. Yeah, so, like, if you're looking at, like, the way you're seen in the public perception, then sure. But, I mean, like, if someone was offering us $9 million to go play hockey and we knew we weren't quite worth that, we're still taking it. Right, but you're well, right. Yeah, I mean, I if mean, he's on a team friendly deal, he probably still it's a plays completely different story. Yeah, he doesn't go to he doesn't go to the Devils. But again, hindsight's twenty twenty. Let's jump to the next topic, and this one's even less. I mean, Connor didn't even want this on the sheet. The Bruins gave some jersey numbers, some not training camp plug jersey numbers to some some of our rookies. Um, Beecher got number nineteen, and Lysel got number twenty one. That does mean it unequivocally unequivocally does mean the Bruins see these guys as players on their roster does not mean it's this year. It's that simple. They gave these guys NHL numbers because they think one day they will be NHL players. And they think one day they will be NHL impact players because they gave them numbers that other guys coming in might want. At the same time, it means really stupid about all of that. Yeah. This could turn out exactly like the Anaheim ducks where their star rookie players change their number after a season. Yeah, no, those that's what they were doing though. I think like they wanted nineteen and twenty one. Those are those are NHL. No, numbers. they didn't. What do you mean? You know the reason why they took those numbers, right? It was because their numbers year. were taken. No, yeah, I, yeah, I know it was their draft year, but they went with not, their draft year. Yeah, because no, I saw number still, eleven. Those are still good NHL numbers, man. Oh, I know, but I'm that's saying like, that's I saw like, number eleven. Yeah, I, seventeen. Yeah, Felino well, and Frederick have those numbers. Yeah, yeah no. they're not getting them. They're not going to – I don't think we see these guys change the time. Well, Felino's in the last year of his deal, so – Yeah, Beecher could go to 17. 19's a a good number. 
Like 19 is not a number you want to like get away from, and neither is 20. Oh, I like 19. I think it didn't work out for the last number 19, now did it? The last significant 19. No. Who? Hmm. He was a center. Hmm. Yeah, it could have been. Well, we're actually going to talk about him a little later in the pod, so we'll wait for that. But yeah, no, I mean, yeah, we talked. I mean, Zegers did change his number to what? What Zegers go to? Do we remember? Is it nine? It went to Zegers a lower to? number. I know Drysdale went to six. Zegers went to eleven. Yeah, I was gonna say nine or eleven, somewhere yeah, in something. there. He went from um, forty-six, and I love how I heard so many podcasts talk about like forty-six is like a shitty training camp number, and they couldn't come up with any famous forty-sixes that ever played. David I was Krejci. like, how about David Krejci? Like in my head, I was just, you know, just yelling at the wall, like David Krejci. But let's jump into some more around the league news. We're going to get into the East and our Salt of the East segment. 